beloved one i hope you are doing well i want us to take a short reading from the book of psalms chapter 127 it says if god's grace doesn't help the builders they will labor in vain to build a house if god's mercy doesn't protect the city all the centuries will circle it in vain it's really a senseless to work so hard from morning till late at night toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough now god can provide i want you to see that it says god can provide for his devoted lovers even while they sleep now this tells us of the great things that we enjoy any time we come into God's presence. It tells us of the blessings we enjoy any time we are with God. And then we can do this through prayer, through the word of God, and even as we are about listening to that. So I want us to do something. We are going to like this video. So then please hit on the like button if you have not done so. This helps YouTube recommend this video out there to anyone, so everyone can have access to it. Also, by doing this, you help in the spread of the gospel and of the good work of this channel. Then, don't forget to leave a comment in that comment section. Hit on that subscribe button if you haven't done so and you are new here. And then get on to the notification bell and do us the favor of tapping on it too. You were blessed and stay blessed. King of kings, Lord of lords, faithful and true, Lamb of God, we worship you. You're the Lamb of God, we worship you. You're the Lamb of God, we worship you. One more time. You're the Lamb of God. Give me an encounter tonight. Lift your voice and pray. You've heard what God is doing in the life of others. It is my turn by faith. It is my turn by your mercy to testify, to sing the songs of praise and songs of victory. Someone is praying. Bible says give us this day our daily bread that which makes you effective that which makes you victorious it is my turn to testify take a minute to connect by faith tonight Lamb of God we were you. Lamb of God, we worship you. From the rising of the sun, right on till it's going down, I will sing of the glory of the Lord. I will sing of the favor of the Lord. I will sing of the power of the Lord. I will sing of the goodness of the Lord. I will sing of the wisdom of the Lord. Father, give me an encounter tonight. Let there be an evidence in my life and through my life that I met you. Let there be an evidence that I have experienced your faithfulness, that I've experienced your mercy, that I've experienced your grace, that I've experienced your wonder walking power. Hello, Madonna. Hello, Madonna. Hello, Madonna. Hello, Madonna. Hello, Madonna.
let it cover all the earth. Let the weight of your glory fall. Let it cover all. Let the weight of your glory fall. your kingdom come. This is our prayer tonight. Let your kingdom come over our lives. Let your kingdom reign. Let your kingdom reign. Your kingdom reign in my life. Adonai. Let that be your prayer tonight. Adonai. Thank you, Jesus. Always doing good. Always lifting men. Always transforming our understanding. Always empowering your people. Always giving them a reason to be joyful, a reason to advance. We thank you and we bless you and we honor you and we worship you tonight. Let the nations know that we love you. Let the nations know that your wisdom is an advantage in the world of men. Let the nations know you are a good God. Let the nations know you are exalted. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Let the entrance of your word indeed give light. Let it give understanding to the simple. Lift us by your word. Adjust our understanding. Correct us. Rebuild us. Prune us. Empower us. Reposition us for excelling, victorious Christian lives. We vow to give you the glory. We vow to give you the glory. For in the majestic and wonderful name of Jesus, we have worship. Shout a believing amen. amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. God bless you. Good evening, everybody. Hallelujah. This is Koinonia. You are most welcome. In the mighty name of Jesus. For all who are connecting across the globe, thank you for being part of our worship tonight. The Lord will do you good in Jesus' name. And then for all our guests who have come from far and near, you're most welcome. This will be one encounter that you will speak of for many days and many years to come in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're honored tonight to have in our presence Mr. Ola Olukoyede, the chairman of EFCC. Give him a big, big, big God bless you. EFCC, make sure you clap. Are you clapping? <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you, sir. Really honor you. Thank you. 
EFCC is the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Thank you very much, sir. Honor to have you in our midst in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to start tonight by speaking over your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, whatever is required for your rising in this season, I call upon the God of heaven. May he make it available for you. May he make it available for you. The wisdom needed, let it be yours. The help needed, let it be yours. The access needed, let it be yours. The influence needed, let it be yours. The grace needed, let it be yours. The courage needed, let it be yours. In the name of Jesus, every force that keeps you down goes down for your sake. Every force attempting to keep you down goes down for your sake. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy over your life, go forward. Go forward. Make progress. Go forward. Make progress. I say it again, go forward. Make progress. Shame and reproach is far from your life. Stagnation is far from your life. Let it be clear that the hand of God is upon you. Let it be clear that the wisdom of God is upon you. Let it be clear that the favor of God is upon you. Let it be clear that you have become Beulah and Hephzibah. In the name of Jesus, men will look at your life and they will learn God. They will look at your life and they will desire to know him. They will look at your life and turn away from evil. They will look at your life and press for righteousness. They will look at your life and love the things of God. In the name of Jesus, tonight receive beauty for ashes. I say it again, receive beauty for ashes. In the name of Jesus, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that you would be glorified through your life. May strangers feed your flock. Gentiles come to the brightness of your rising. Even their kings to the brightness of your rising. I speak to you again, arise and shine. Arise and shine by the spirit of the living God. For in Jesus' name we pray. Please be seated. Prophecy is powerful. People are made in the kingdom by the speakings that come upon them. I prophesied as I was commanded, he said, and there was a sound. Every genuine prophecy is not without an effect in the spirit. May you testify. In the name of Jesus Christ. Call everybody you can call for those of you online. Gather them tonight and tell them your life is about to change. You want to listen to tonight's teaching? I'm committed by the Spirit of God according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The Bible mandates that we do not slack in giving ourselves over to the flock which the Holy Ghost has made us overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. My commitment to you by grace and under God is to see that the word that comes in season that helps you to know God, to be transformed, to be empowered, and to live victorious lives as believers and as light within your territory, that that word is always available and tonight will be one of such encounters. You believe that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Tonight we're on a journey by the Spirit and by His Word, I want to show you a very deep and profound mystery. I seek to answer a few questions tonight, questions that many of you have asked, probably without answers. And tonight really is a journey to the experience of liberty. I want to show you something from the Scripture that will bring you to the experience of the liberty of the saints. God wants to help us see through the lens of Scripture tonight why Many well-intentioned, born-again believers never live to experience the victorious life that is in Christ. Genuinely saved believers who are frustrated, discouraged, they live defeated lives under the clear, unmistakable reign of darkness, infirmities, and all kinds of things, the vicissitudes of life. There is an explanation when a believer who is genuinely saved fails to project through his or her life the victory that is in Christ. There is an explanation as to why such a state 
is possible. Hallelujah. The beauty and glory that comes with the faith life, the beauty and glory that comes with the spirit life is hardly visible in the life of many believers. And this has misrepresented God in many degrees. So we have professing Christians genuinely saved for many, but their lives is hardly a reflection of the glory of God. And it is difficult for men to desire to know God, to learn him, to love him, and to serve him. If your life were the only vista through which people would see and know God, many people will turn away from the God of the Bible because your life for many believers has failed to become a picture that attracts people to Jesus. I'm teaching tonight on the ministry of light. The ministry of light. We'll look at a few scriptures very quickly as God grants us grace. First, John 8, 32. This is Jesus speaking. And he makes a very profound statement. John 8 and verse 32. He says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Now, I will talk a bit more on this, but up front to explain something to you. There are two components to this statement. The second component is not your responsibility. The second component is sustained by God's integrity. But the first component is your responsibility. He says, and ye shall know the truth. And if it is the truth indeed that you know. Are we together? Programmed within that truth is the power to bring you liberty. Second scripture. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. I'd like you to shout the first two words that you see. Ready? One, two, read. One more time. One more time. He never said those who are alienated from me. He never said those who are under the sway of the devil. It's interesting that God speaking by the prophet starts by owning up to the fact that these are my people. I'm not ashamed to call them my people. Regardless their state, they are still my people. The prodigal son met his son in the rot and the death that his life, he still called him my son, and the son still called him my father, but that did not change the state of the boy. It didn't change the fact that he was already feeding with swine, probably unhealthy, defeated, and weak, and yet he called the father my father. The father identified him even in that state as a son. So it was not a question of whether he was son or whether he was father. It was that there was a tragic situation. And he says, my people. Let's finish that scripture. Even though they are my people. Are you ready for the next two words now? Are destroyed. Ready? One, two, go. What kind of a statement is this? My people. You would think the kind of person owning up to these people. The next two words should not follow such a statement. When God says, my people, you expect what looks like God to follow after. My people. It's like a billionaire speaking and says, my son. You would want to think owns a bank. You would want to think owns a company. Then he says, my son is a miserable beggar. Does that statement make sense? Not with the credibility of the person speaking in this example. So he says, my people. And you would think what will follow that statement is are greatly favored. My people representing me in power and wisdom. But he speaks by the spirit through the prophet and he says, my people, even though they are my people, he says they are destroyed. That sounds to me like some sense of irresponsibility on his part. But he gives the reason why they are destroyed. If he just said my people are destroyed, we will charge God for not being faithful as a father. But he gives the reason. They are my people. I do not want them destroyed. I do not want them defeated. It is not in my plan for them. My character negates my children being in that state. He says, but they are still destroyed. In spite of my fatherhood. In spite of the fact that I am an epitome of love. They are destroyed. And he gives the reason. Let's finish the scripture. He says, for the lack of knowledge for the lack of knowledge 
it is amazing that Satan is not mentioned as the primary reason for their state or destruction. It just says for the lack of knowledge. He further says, because thou hast rejected. That means it was offered. You cannot reject what was not offered. Am I right on that? If I offer you some meal or refreshment and you say, no, thank you. It was offered, but you rejected it, even if to your detriment. So here he explains for us something very profound. That number one, they are my people. But number two, their current state is that they perpetually live in destruction. And he says the reason is because of lack of knowledge. And just before you question God and say, but they don't have the capacity to know by themselves. He says, because you have rejected knowledge. That means at some point, knowledge came to you. It came through men. It came through vessels. And you, of your own accord, you rejected knowledge. Are you ready for the third scripture? Thank you, Jesus. Many have rejected knowledge to their detriment. Ephesians 4, 18. Having the understanding darkened. Whose understanding? The understanding of the believer. His understanding is darkened. What is darkness? The absence of light. Because the Bible says that which makes manifest is light. Then he says, as a result of that state, so the believer is saved, born again, but there is a condition and that there are consequences to being in that condition. The consequence is that you are alienated from the life of God. You know what that means? You are robbed off from seeing the potential that is in that life. It is through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Now, let me tell you the truth. The ratio of Christians and churchgoers who are frustrated, oppressed, discouraged, seems to me to outweigh the ratio of believers who are walking in the experience of victory. That if you take a statistical sample of people within church, generally, with no biases, and you actually gauge them as touching the matters of victory and a life of meaning, you are going to find out that for the most part, the believers, faithfuls, churchgoers, something seems to be wrong, that the ratio of those walking in the experience of the victory that this divine life proposes is by far, by far, it outweighs those who are genuinely walking in the experience of that victory. The Bible is very clear as to the fact that the thief, John 10.10, 10, that he cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come. Do you see that his ministry is beyond giving salvation? The word salvation comes from the word salvage, deliverance, from a state from destruction. What Jesus came to give us was beyond just deliverance from sin and Satan. He said, I am come that ye may have, beginning from the standpoint of salvation, but that ye may have life, he says, and that that life should be in abundance. Amplified will say in its fullest or in its fullness. So many believers are unable to experience the liberty that is in Christ. And let me tell you the truth. If this is not addressed and if believers do not know why, sooner or later, many people, like it is already happening across the body of Christ, people are getting frustrated as to why my prayer life seems to be there for many. I'm coming to church, perhaps a worker. How long will it take me to see the faithfulness of God in my life? Did God design a system that for more than half of my life, I will not have an opportunity to testify that God is good. Let me tell you the truth. If believers cannot see the faithfulness of God captured within their lives, they will begin to delve to the corridors of compromises and they will begin to fall away from the authenticity of their faith pursuit. But there is an answer. Tonight's teaching seeks to bring you that answer. If you are in this place and you honestly know that there is more. You have not enjoyed the victory that is in Christ. I want you to listen very carefully. 
it is an age-long mistake in our approach to understanding the things of God. This has evolved into a system that has perpetually kept believers in defeat. May God grant us understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the dynamics of liberty. How did God design for the saints to walk in the experience of liberty? Because the scripture we read said, ye shall know the truth. And he told us that light, which also is truth, light from scripture talks of illumination, talks of knowledge, talks of revelation, talks of understanding. Everything that enlightens, everything that makes manifest, everything that reveals and dominates darkness is called light. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us that light is associated with liberty. But the administration of that liberty is where many believers are found wanting. And that includes many, many of us men and women of God scattered across the body of Christ. Because like you will be learning, it's an uncomfortable truth. But believers within any organization, any ministry, are at the mercy of the knowledge, the limited knowledge or the excellency of the knowledge of the priests that serve them truth. Are we together now? Believers will always be at the mercy of the extent of revelation of the ministers that serve them truth so that my limitation can be replicated in thousands and millions of people in a moment this is the implication of being the mouthpiece of god in one moment you can bring liberty to millions and in one moment you can put people or reinforce their bondage depending on the light that you have that comes from you to them the Bible says that was the true light that lighted every man. Let's look at the dynamics of liberty. How did God design for us to step into the experience of liberty? How did God design that the administration of eternal life, how is it transmuted to my life and your life to the point that my life becomes a holistic capture of the excellency that comes with the divine life? By the way, let me remind you of a few things before we delve into this discussion. I think it bears reminding you that one of the major endpoints, and I've taught you here, but for the sake of those who are just joining, the endpoint or the major components of the endpoint, as far as the believer's pursuit is that you will become eventually an experiential manifestation of the glory of God. You remember that? That in God dealing with men, this is the idea behind his calling you from darkness into his marvelous light. Not just that you are saved, but that eventually your life becomes an experiential manifestation of the glory of God. Romans 8, 18 says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, it says, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. There is a measure of glory deposited by prophecy. It's in every believer's destiny that your lifetime should be a journey that captures and reveals the glory of God to the nations. Are we together? God is glorified when the saints allow his glory to flow through them. It says, herein is our Father glorified, John 15 and verse 8, when ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go, go, not just go and roam around, go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Hallelujah. God is glorified. Ephesians 2, 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto what? One more time. Unto what? So the Bible tells us that we are created. God had an intent. He didn't just come to die for nothing. He died because of love. But in addition to love, he had a goal to bring us into good work, which God had before ordained. The same way from the foundations of the earth, the lamb was slain. From the foundations of the earth, God had a goal for man too. Are we together? He ordained that we should walk in them. 
the dynamics of liberty. Please listen. Let me also remind you that I taught us last week, if you recall, that revelation is like a vehicle. It has an assignment of stopping you from stagnancy. Revelation has a unique ability to bring transitions to your life. That every time light comes to you, it stops you from remaining at the same position. It is impossible to be enlightened and to remain there. But the people that sat in darkness, is that in your Bible? It says they have seen a great light. Arise, shine, for your light is come. And the Spirit entered me when he spake unto me. When light came by prophecy over the bones in Ezekiel 37, they started moving. Bones joined to his bones. So every time true revelation comes, it brings transition. Moving people from their lower self to higher dimensions of themselves. Transiting you to become more like Christ. Transiting you to reveal the excellency that comes with the faith life. Hallelujah. Now let's get to the dynamics of transport of liberty I want to help you understand number one in order of spiritual priority God in creating a system that administers his grace his life his power and victory to the believer designed this system such that your first encounter as far as the journey to liberty is concerned is called salvation or what we call being born again or the new birth experience this is a very simple statement but follow carefully in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible tells us that for God so loved the world, he gave his only then begotten son, that whosoever, I've taught you that this blessing is for whosoever, believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Are we together? Romans 10, 9 and 10. The Bible says that if you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead and confessing with your mouth the lordship of Jesus, you shall be saved. The general rule is in verse 10 that with the heart, the heart is the instrument of believing unto righteousness and that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Are we together? In 1 John chapter 5, reading from 11 and 12, I'm showing you that the starting point of any believer's desire to experience liberty and freedom that is in Christ is start with salvation. If for any reason you follow the path that you propose or is proposed to you to bring you liberty and you bypass salvation, you've already gotten it wrong. Are we together? You can encounter a miracle service, you can encounter a deliverance service, you can encounter a healing meeting, whatever it is, any route you follow is simply an inferior route. God's route, God's system of administering liberty to the saints, bringing the saints to the experience of the God life, of liberty, of power, is that number one, they experience salvation or being born again. First John chapter 5, 11 and 12 and this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life say eternal life and that this life is in his son read verse 12 with me if you can see it ready one to read he that hath the son uh -huh, hath life and he that hath not the son of God hath not life it's as simple as that say salvation one more time say salvation the new birth experience is the starting point. Now, listen carefully. The new birth experience I wrote here, you may want to write now. The new birth experience is not the totality of the believer's experience, but the starting point of the journey to liberty and victory. Let me take it again. That the new birth experience is not the totality of the believer's experience. No. That is not all the believers should experience. It is the starting point of a journey that eventually culminates to victory and liberty in experience. Just not knowing this alone will keep you defeated forever, even when you are saved. 
the new birth experience in order of spiritual priority is the starting point but not the totality of the believer's experience it is only the starting point of a journey that should lead to victory and liberty second point about salvation that you should know in helping you understand the dynamics of liberty i wrote here is that being saved listen being saved by confessing the lordship of jesus does not automatically bring you into the experience of victory hmm. being saved by confessing the lordship of jesus genuinely so does not automatically bring you into the experience of victory many sincere believers have been victims of this there is a narrative that the moment you get saved automatically you begin to function in the experience of victory it is not so jesus who came as a pattern man that was not even the pattern he followed that was not the pattern the apostles followed if that is your understanding something is wrong that needs to be adjusted being saved by confessing the lordship of jesus does not automatically in itself bring you into the experience of victory. Now listen carefully. Being saved or being born again gives you access, not experience. Being saved gives you access, not experience. It gives you access. The door is open. The new and living way is open. Now you can access it. Jesus started by saying, I am the way. Is that in your Bible? Why did he bring that description? I am the way. That way leads you to truth. And that truth administers life. It's not just I am the way. You can choose the way. Or you can choose the truth. It's still me. Or you can choose. No, it is a map he's giving you. That in learning me and in experiencing life, you don't start experiencing life by experiencing life. You start experiencing life by finding the way. If it is the right way, it will lead you to reality, truth. And there is something you do with that truth that will give you life. Did you get that? I am the way. It's a path. So the moment you find the way, you start rejoicing because the way is proof that you are already on the journey to experiencing life indeed. When he says, I am come that ye may have life, this is the dynamics. You don't have life by just having life. You have life by knowing and finding the way. If you follow the wrong way, that already corrupts your potential to experiencing life. But that when you find the way, you don't just jump into life. Between the way and the experience of life, there is something called truth. You can find the way and yet not interact with the truth. And you will find out that even though it is in prophecy, even though it is part of the package of eternal life, that you should walk in life indeed, you may never see it in your life. I am the way. If you follow that path correctly, it will lead you to truth. And there is something that happens to you when you interact with that truth. The end point is life. So salvation grants you access. Access to now begin the journey that administers inexperience. Because you see, the initial new birth experience affects your spirit man principally. Please listen carefully. The part in the salvation experience that is instant and finished is your spirit man, not your mind and not your body. Are we together now? So when an individual comes to Christ and confesses his lordship, what part of him exactly receives that life? It is a spirit interaction. That is why, with all due respect, the person can be as foolish as he came to the altar and return back and still act foolishly, even though he received Jesus. Are we together now? Yeah. The person can have struggles while on stage and go back and you'll be surprised. Now, potentially, he has come into the way 
and he has received a deposit of that life in his spirit man. But he does not need it there. It needs to be lived out in the physical realm. And that there is a protocol, there is a rule of engagement that translates the reality of that life such that tomorrow you can see the one saved person and know that this person has become a child of God. The effulgence of eternal life has spilled over from his spirit man. Now his body, his life, his condition becomes a testament that he has met Jesus. If there was nothing more to initial salvation, there would be no need for pastors because there are people who met God on their own. There would be no need for churches. There would be no need for empowerment programs. Are we together now? There would be no need for the fivefold ministry. In fact, there would be no need for the Holy Spirit after you are saved. Why did God so design it that it is even after you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit? It means it is a journey. And that that journey, you cannot go on your own. That is the reason why the moment you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes to help you and begins that journey. And God plants you under a teaching ministry that now begins to build you. He says, this is life eternal, John 17, 3, that they may know, not just that they may receive, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus, whom thou hast sent. If you're with me, say amen. amen. So we're discussing the ministry of light, and under this we're looking at the dynamics of liberty. And I said, number one, liberty starts with having this encounter with Jesus. God's intent for the believer was not just salvation from sin and Satan. Please listen to this. God's intent for the believer was not just salvation from sin and Satan, but an opportunity to live in victory while serving his purposes. That means when the believer becomes saved, that is not all God's goal for him. It is the starting point. Are we together? God's goal for the believer or intent for the believer was not just salvation from sin and Satan. But that after salvation from sin and Satan, that believer comes into a point of victory. Living and enjoying victory that comes with the divine life while serving the purposes of the kingdom. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3 and 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Here's what the Bible says. In fact, let's start from verse 1 to put it in context. I exhort therefore, he says, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3. For this is good. What is good? That art of praying for those in authority is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Now digresses and gives you a more information about that God. That God will have all men to be what? Uh-huh. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You see that now? God's desire is number one, to have all men saved. But it does not just leave them there. That when they are now saved, the starting point of the journey, then they come unto the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because it is in knowing the truth that you are free. Free indeed. salvation the experience of the new birth it is not the total experience that the believer needs it is the initial experience that brings you into the kingdom that means if you are not saved there is no access for you to enjoy other benefits in the kingdom are you seeing why salvation is important you cannot bypass salvation and use miracles to get life you will not because everybody Jesus saved before he died, are we together? Everybody that Jesus healed before he died was not saved. They still died. Everybody that Jesus delivered before he died, there was no possibility of receiving eternal life before Jesus died. But there was a possibility of healing, multiplying bread. Every miracle you seek to happen in your life already happened to men before they received Jesus. So if you just use miracles and signs and wonders as a replacement for salvation, that is already a mistake. That when you want people to become a manifestation of God's glory, look up please, you will have to give them more than a healing. 
you will have to give them more than deliverance from demon spirits. Because even if you cast out those demon spirits and they are not saved, the demon spirits have a legitimate access to still return to that body. Legitimate. Are we together? If you prophesy over people and they get jobs, that is wonderful. But those jobs, they are still under the influence of the systems and the structures of life. They've not been elevated by the blessings that come with salvation. Salvation is very important. Every believer intending to be like God in experience and to experience the liberty that is in Christ, the first part of call. That means, listen, look at me. Every time you see someone sick, think salvation first before healing. You get the point? Yes. Every time you see someone depressed, if someone comes to talk to you and say, I don't like the way my life is, just look at them. You may counsel the person, but I'm saying God in God's mind, if you want that person to experience lasting liberty, the most important discussion, regardless what state, is the salvation of that person. If that person could not be healed by your hand and you get that person saved, you have put him on the way. He has come closer to experiencing the truth that will bring him life. Are we together? Now, there are many people who sometimes, they have people who are sick, depressed. They have people who are poor, looking for help. And they are not able to provide all those other helps. But they are able to lead the person to Jesus and they still live disappointed. They say, but this person was looking for rent. I couldn't give him rent, but I preached to him about Jesus and he got genuinely saved. Let me tell you, you have done something noble in the kingdom because you have brought that person closer to solving that rent problem forever. Because with the way will come access to the truth. You see that now? And if it is truth indeed, eventually he will experience life and life in all its ramification, which includes being prosperous. Let's go to the next point. Dynamics of liberty. So number one is salvation. But I told you that salvation by confessing the lordship of Jesus does not automatically bring you into the experience of victory. Please listen to that. It is rather concerned with giving you access. The second aspect of walking in the experience of liberty is called knowing the truth. <laughs> knowing the truth. Knowing the truth, my God. That means in addition to receiving life from the Savior, you need to know the truth. You have met the Savior, but you need to know the truth that he brings. If you do not know the truth that came with the Savior, you will remain defeated even though you genuinely met the Savior. What is knowing the truth? It describes the whole process from accessing light to being transformed by it. When the Bible talks about knowing the truth, it's a holistic capture of the entire process from accessing light after you are saved to being transformed by it. Ye shall know the truth and the truth that you know shall set you free. The word know there is beyond just awareness. He's not just saying you will be aware of an information that is correct. That is, no, 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 no. No, you can be aware of an information and it profits you nothing. So when the Bible talks of knowing the truth, it's a deeper statement than English just gives to us. The idea to the layman is being aware of an information. No, knowing the truth is a, is a journey on its own. A journey from accessing that light, that truth, until you become transformed by it. Knowing the truth requires three steps. Let me give them to you. Knowing the truth based on the Bible's idea requires three steps. Number one, Access to the truth. Knowing the truth requires, number one, access to the truth. The first way you begin your journey to knowing the truth is to even have access to it. Access to the word. Access to the Holy Spirit. Access to the ministry of the teaching priest. You see that? These are the three ways by which God communicates truth to us. Number one, 
his word. Number two, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the ministry of the teaching priest. If you ignore the ministry of the word, if you ignore the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and if you ignore the ministry of the teaching priest, there is no opportunity for you to access truth again. You will find out that you will be saved, but you will never come into the victory that is in Christ. Let me remind you again, if you are in pursuit of truth, these are the three areas to look at. Number one, the word of God. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Are we together? The entrance of thy word giveth light and understanding unto the simple. Number two, the Holy Spirit. He's called the spirit of truth. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all truth. That is John 16 from verse 13. He shall guide you. He's called the spirit of truth. That means his advocacy is that of truth. You can trust his ministry. The spirit of truth. And then number three, the teaching priest. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. And I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. And if they are pastors or shepherds indeed, they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. The utopian Enoch was reading and he did not understand and God brought Philip to him and he said, please tell me, who is this man talking about, himself or another? And he began to expantiate and expound the truth for him. And it was on account of the ministry of the teaching priest that he got saved on his chariot and highlighted when he saw a pool and said, there is water here, nothing stops me from being baptized. And as soon as he was baptized, the spirit of God took Philip. There are many believers who want to grow, but they do not know where to search for growth. The word of God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the ministry of the teaching priest. Let me tell you the truth. When God really wants to help you, he grants you access to a man of God that he has given the grace for light. Woe betides a believer who does not have the privilege of sitting under the mentorship of a teaching priest. I tell you, your Christian journey will be a circle of pain. Pain that will make you distrust God. You will wonder and say, is this, is, what I'm reading in the Bible, is it real? You see, most of us men of God do not understand the reason why the Bible says we will be judged. Because the privilege of priesthood is God giving you access, literally, access to the destinies of men. You are walking representing God to mold and make or break and destroy the destinies of men. And that comes by the quality or otherwise of the spiritual information that is given to them. What you are learning from here week in, week out, that is what is shaping your understanding onto a life of victory or onto a life of defeat. Are you seeing that now? It is a risk. To submit yourself, submit your mind, submit your understanding. And then for families that are here, you imagine a man and his wife and the three children. These are the three boys that represent the future of that family. And all of them come to sit under a man of God. It is not only the man's destiny that is at a risk. His future is at a risk. Because what he's learning is also what the children will learn. So if it is error, that entire generation has been destroyed. It is the reason why God will judge teachers. He will say, where did you get this one that you are teaching? You got this one because you are hungry. And you went to the extent of deceiving people. You got the money, but you destroyed destinies. The prophet that you emerged did not emerge. You hid the truth. You were afraid of being criticized. And you did not say this. You didn't say that. Hallelujah. You see the reason why the work of priesthood is not a vocation. It's not something you look at just when you are hungry and you say, well, I applied for civil defense. My name didn't come out. I applied for um, immigration. My name didn't come out. Well, I think there's at least, I hear that pastors get money, free money from people. Let me try ministry and see. That corrupted motif alone if God brings people to you, you will destroy their destiny. And because Africa is a very religious continent, you see that now? 
When you go to school, there is a date for graduation and you leave that school. But when you are under a spiritual structure, you are usually there for the rest of your life. Are we together now? Yes. If you receive error for any reason in school, it can be corrected. At least you stop going there. But once you are on, there are people who are in church, they started coming to church when they are 10 years. Now they are 50, 60 years. Your destiny will be at the mercy of the correctness or otherwise of the truth you have received. And I want you to pay attention to what I want to share with you now. Access to the truth starts by access to the word, access to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and access to a teaching priest. A teaching priest. Doesn't matter what form or fashion it comes. A teaching priest. What makes a teaching priest a teaching priest is beyond a good heart. You can be a sincere man of God, but not be a teaching priest. If you are not a teaching priest, don't teach. Do what is within the jurisdiction of your grace. Are we together now? To teach means to bring people into a comprehension of a truth. And there is a grace for that. It is not just something you decide. A teaching priest is more than brain work. It's the product of the spirit of revelation. Granting you access to doctrine, granting you access to principles and the ways of God in an unusual way for the sake of the people sent to you. So the excellency of the preaching, uh, teaching priest is beyond his study life. Is beyond his level of intelligence. All those things are enhancers. The grace for the teaching ministry is an endowment from God. If you don't have it, no matter how you do, it will be clear that this grace is not on you. You will destroy people. Let me tell you the truth. If you have the grace of a teaching priest, God can walk through your limitations, even linguistic limitations. And you will see that even though you may not be as articulate, but because of the spirit that flows through your words, the people will understand what you intended to say and it will not deceive them. That is the difference between oratory and utterance. When God grants you utterance to speak his counsel, both the learned and unlearned will eventually understand you. They can pick the spirit communications from what you are saying. And even though you are limited, I'm not saying you should not train yourself. When you have utterance and oratory, it's a beautiful combo that helps you to articulate truth with clarity and precision, but that even if you are limited physically, when the spirit of revelation is upon you and God has given you the mandate of a teaching priest, you will be surprised that no matter how simple or complicated you are, the spirit of God can move through your frailty and insist that the people understand you. Are we learning? Access to truth. The second layer to knowing the truth is to hear and receive the truth. You can have access, ladies and gentlemen, but not hear and receive. I'll give you an example of those who had that. The scribes and the Pharisees had access to truth. Their issue was never access. They were in almost all of Jesus' crusades, but they did not hear and they did not receive. While Jesus was preaching, they were just looking for where to get trouble, where to pin him down. One time they met Jesus sitting, maybe preparing, meditating, preparing, and they brought up all kinds of issues. Issues of the, uh, you know, the woman who was caught in adultery, the woman who was, um, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the gentleman who was about to be healed that he said, your sins are forgiven. Ah, that became, said, who are you to forgive sins? And they brought up another issue, and they would never listen to the truth. It was Nicodemus, one among them, that listened carefully and said, no. This, what this man is saying. And he smuggled himself and came to him by night. John 3, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And that discussion is what led to John chapter 3 down to 16, 17. Many people have access to light. But many people are not intentional about hearing and receiving. Do you know people come to church like this and you will be surprised the many things that happen while the word is coming. Destiny defining truths, light from heaven through his vessel. God comes to men through men. He saw the captivity of Israel 
and he said, I am come down. And that happened through the man, Moses. So God ministers to men through men. I have commanded a widow to feed you. But when Elijah met the widow, he said, I can't remember any command. When was she commanded? When the prophet said, go and make me this. That was God speaking to her through him. God speaks to men through men, primarily. So people get distracted, for instance, in church. While this is happening, another person is thinking, calculating profits, typing text messages, doing all that they are doing. And those distractions are largely demonic. Why do you think Satan comes to church? To hear what I'm saying? He comes to church because you are coming to church. Everywhere God is, Satan wants to be there too. Because he knows that everywhere God is, there is something that will lead to life. And everywhere God is, he gives men what he can steal, he can kill, he can destroy. So every time Satan is looking for what to steal, he first looks for where God is going. Because every time God shows up, he gives things to men. And that's what Satan wants to steal. Are we together? A man can receive nothing except it is given to him. So Satan knows um, they are on their way to church and he comes too. He doesn't have to be invited. Hanging around the corridors of where the saints are and he's waiting quietly. And the moment a word is coming that is explaining why your life, your family, your ministry is where it is, he distracts you. Using all kinds of things. From slumber to carelessness to whatever it is. And you find out that your word just slipped. May your mind be at alert to receive that which is yours in the name of Jesus. You want to be transformed by the light of God to experience liberty? You access the truth. That means you must come within the proximity of where the truth is. Listen, how many of you know that if you see, let's say for instance, our father in the Lord that the Jew, you hear that he's holding a crusade somewhere. How many of you know that if you are trusting God for healing, by coming close to the crusade ground, your chances for that healing is already increased? Is that true? The man that they tore the roof and brought him down, do you think that man would have been healed at home like that? Most likely not. Even the one who was healed at home, there was someone who came near Jesus to plead for him. Proximity to where God is walking is proof that you will encounter that God. Did you hear what I said? This is why it is important for believers to not miss the gathering of the saints. Proximity. 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 And then hearing and receiving the truth. Most believers don't hear. Most believers don't receive. Most believers don't concentrate. Access to light, but then they do not receive. What is the third area? When you want to know the truth, you access the truth by the ministry of the word, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the ministry of the teaching priest. And then you hear and receive the truth, the light that is communicated. And then number three, now listen to this one. You must submit to transformation with reference to that truth. You must submit to transformation with reference to that truth. I'll take it again. Coming close to the truth and interacting with the truth is wonderful, but that does not get the job done. Hearing and listening is profitable, but that in itself does not get the job done. You must be willing to submit yourself to transformation. And I'm getting to the zenith of our discussion tonight. Transformation by the reference of that truth you have found. This is what administers liberty. I'm going to be showing you how transformation leads you to victory. But it's important. Do not forget these three steps. When you find your life defeated, when you find your life miserable, if you are not saved, you already know that the first diagnosis is that I need salvation, a genuine encounter beyond a man of God, beyond a church. Then when that happens and you stop there, you say, after all, I'm born again. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. An heir, as long as he's a child, he differeth not from a slave. 
responsible parents, you will never carry, say, the key to your car. Let's assume you bought a house in the name of your child. Will you give the child that house at age five? Please talk to me. Will you give that child or you open an account for that child from the time the baby was born? You deposited one million and you said I will keep depositing one million every year or five million every year. By the time the child is 18 or 20 or 25, then I will give it to him as a gift. The question is why are you not giving the child even at age 10? That child has 10 or 20 million in his account that you built for him, but you're not going to give the child. Why? Because of immaturity. Every time you are not transformed, blessings become burdens. Blessings become causes. Good things destroy when it comes into the hands of people who are not transformed. There are many of you today, you forced your way into things that you thought are blessings. But the requisite level of transformation that gives you the stamina and the stature to maximize it. You see that now? You can give your 10-year-old child a car. And that car becomes the reason why you are arrested or he's arrested or the reason why the boy is killed. And forever, if they ask you why did your child die in this example, you will leave him pain. He did not die because you slaughtered him. He died because you gave him something that his growth was not yet ready for. Are you seeing that many of our prayers don't carry this illusion that just because you are talking to God, he must answer everything. Answers depend on many factors before they arrive to the saints. Among them, your level of transformation. Lord, give me 500 members. And God looks at you and weighs you and says no. The safest point for you in ministry is to have 200 members. If I give you 800 members or 1,000 members, do you have the patience? Have you grown to manage the complexities that comes with dealing with people like this? Do you understand the principles of a 1,000 members will usually be called from different walks of life? Do you have the intelligence to communicate truth such that everybody feels blessed? Hear me again. Without growth, blessings can become burdens. Blessings can become causes without transformation. There are many people, what you have prayed for now, if God should answer it, that becomes the reason why you die. Not an attack. There are certain levels of anointings people pray carelessly for. And sometimes in church, we, God knows we, he's a merciful God. Just because you package an envelope does not mean the grace will come on you. There is a spiritual immigration system. You have to pass through it first. Are we together? There are times that you can kneel down before a man of God and say, I want double portion of your anointing. What leaves you from him is his hunger, not his anointing. It's the hunger that you get. Just because you fell down does not mean that you, the man and God knows that nothing came to you. It's just that he can't start explaining all that thing to you and to say, you are blessed, just go. That hunger leads you to this. Now, let me tell you this. Most believers do not know that transformation is the end point of your receiving truth. If you receive light and don't submit to the transforming power of that light, you will never be able to become what that light intended for you to be. Ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. So what was the purpose of learning? Learning was supposed to bring you into an experience, but it failed to do so because the learning part, you are getting it, but you have not immersed yourself into that truth. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up hallelujah how transformation leads you to victory let's discuss this how transformation we're looking at the ministry of light i want to show you the missing link between prophecy and your victorious life 
I want to show you the reason why you keep hearing sermons and shout amen and fall while you are shouting and never become. I want to show you the hindrances, the reason why it looks like Satan remains perpetually powerful over the lives of men, families, territories. How transformation leads you to victory. Write this down. Our realities in this kingdom are shaped by our belief systems, our mindsets, and the quality of our thinking. Our realities in this kingdom is not just shaped by the love of God. Please listen. It's shaped by our belief systems, shaped by our mindsets, shaped by the quality of our thinking. You have that down? That means the reality, the definition of your Christian experience is not just a product of God's love. It's not just a product of prophecy. It's not just a product of what scripture says should be. But that your reality at any given point is a reflection of your belief system, your mindset, and the quality or otherwise of your thinking. Next point. And I want you to please pay attention now. I learned this and it changed my life. I'm grateful to God for the privilege of knowing what I'm showing you now. How do you know a man is not transformed? Let me just say that. Because you will see a conflict between knowledge and the experience of his results. There is a conflict. You will not find ignorance necessarily in the equation, and yet you will not find the attesting results that should defend that knowledge. Whenever you see people who are knowledgeable, and after a long period of time, you cannot find the results that attest to knowledge. Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember years ago, a woman, true story, she complained to me that I need to pray for her child. There's nothing that child does not eat, including rubber. A child that is growing. But the child will never add weight. Never add weight. And the woman became concerned. And she said she didn't know if it was some sickness or whatever. You know, went to the hospital and it looked like nothing was happening. Honestly. Right from when the child was a baby, she said, it will suck and suck and not seem to grow. Looking pale and sickly. And then after the child grew, you know, all kinds of nourishments were coming. That immediately, you don't need to be a doctor to know that something is wrong with that child. By, by the time the child is, say, two, three years, he's still looking pale and sickly as if he's months old. Why is that so? Because the investments that support growth that the child is receiving is not producing the corresponding results. Are you getting that now? So by the time a believer, just like this example, you claim to be receiving truth, to be receiving light, light that brings liberty, truth that brings liberty, but eventually no area of your life can speak the glory of God. It's a sign that the missing link is not necessarily information. It might be information or the quality and the kind of information, but it's that you've not submitted yourself to be transformed by it. How transformation leads to victory. I said the quality of our lives in this kingdom are shaped by our belief systems, our mindsets, and the quality of our thinking. Write this down. The information that is stored in our minds are in layers. The information that is stored in your mind, huh? whether spiritual information or otherwise, just know that the information that is stored in your mind is in layers. And that they exert different levels of power and influence over our lives and our outcomes. The information that is stored in our minds are in layers. That means they don't hold the same strength as far as the influence that they command on our lives. And they exert different levels of power over our lives and over our outcomes. 
The average person has different kinds of information in their minds. And what I'm saying is that all these informations are arranged in your mind in layers. And they do not exert the same kind of power over you. There are certain informations that have a greater hold of you than others. Are we together? Yes. Now listen carefully. The process of transformation is how people become changed from within. The process of transformation is how people become changed from within, not outside, inside, from inside out. I'm about to say something very powerful now, and I don't want you to miss it, that the process of transformation is how people become changed from inside. And how does that happen? Second Corinthians chapter 10. Let's read 4 and 5. I want to show you something Paul said in teaching us the dynamics of transformation. For the weapons of our warfare, please let me have your attention, are not carnal. The word carnal means man-made. Huh? But mighty through God. Is that in your Bible? It says to the pulling down of what? What do the weapons do? Please talk to me. They pull down. They pull down what? Strongholds. Uh huh. What else do the weapons do? They cast down. Are you seeing the, the assignment of those weapons now? The weapons pull down strongholds. The weapons cast down imagination. What else? And every high thing that exalted itself. Now look at me. The assignment of those weapons is not necessarily to eradicate the wrong things. It is the position of those information that the weapons are concerned about. Keep that scripture there. Are we together now? The reason why they pull down the, the strongholds, the imaginations, and the high thing is because those things have exalted themselves above the knowledge of Christ. Did you get that now? That means because they have exalted themselves above the knowledge of Christ, they have the strongest influence on you. So even though the knowledge of Christ is there, it is not sufficient for your life to show that you are a Christian because there are certain information that have a greater pull. Did you see that now? He said, casting down imagination and every high thing, not low thing. So it's about position. It's a high thing that exalted itself. That knowledge kept fighting its way until it, become more than the, it became more than the word of God in your heart. That knowledge, be it culture, be it limitation, be it demonic information, it kept growing. So when Satan wants to destroy you, he gives you access to knowledge and that knowledge keeps pushing its way until it becomes the most exalted information. And psychologists and even the Bible teaches us that your life will gravitate along your most dominant or your strongest points. Listen carefully. weapons of our warfare they are weapons so they are not there for play and the bible says they are not man-made the bible says they have an assignment to number one pull down what is pull down bring it to a position where it does not exert influence and then number two is said casting down again imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself above the knowledge. That means the reference is the knowledge of God. Is that in your Bible? The reference is what? The knowledge of God. And then to bring into captivity every thought. What weapons? So when those weapons get into you, huh? they are like what your white blood cells do. Look at me. From a medical standpoint, when somebody breaks down and they take his blood samples and they say you are sick, does that remove white blood cells from your life? It's just that they were not strong enough to fight what is fighting you. And you will need help. You will need aid. Is that true? But sometimes you live so healthy and they can tell you eat fruits, eat this, and you can be so strong for a long time you've not fallen sick. It didn't mean the sickness did not come around you. But you have maintained a position of health. Are you getting that point now? Did the Bible not say they are life to those who find and health? Hmm. 
casting down every high thing. So how does transformation happen? This entire four and five is how transformation happens. Transformation is warfare. Transformation is not a journey of intelligence. It's a journey of warfare. Because there are certain information programmed by Satan and systems and structures to see to it that regardless the potential of the life you have received, that your life keeps failing perpetually. My God, listen, it is because of this that we can have with all due respect a very, very intelligent person. Have you seen brilliant people who are poor? Brilliant people who are mediocre because it's not what they read that is controlling their lives. It's the most dominant thoughts. That's why a man can be a lecturer and suffer what he's teaching. His problem is not ignorance. His problem is that the, the information controlling his life is not academics. It's his most dominant thought. If that person believes he's a failure, even as a professor, his knowledge, even if he's teaching CRK, he will still fail. we learning so transformation happens by pulling down strongholds transformation happens by casting down imaginations watch this transformation happens by pulling any information and any reasoning that fights to be higher than the knowledge of God Everything that fights to be higher than scripture is your enemy. Now, there are informations that are not bad. Is What you need to do is regulate their position, like what you studied. What you studied is not demonic, but the moment it contains the word of God, it can still be there. Some of those things are not to be removed. They are to be dethroned. Because the influence they are exerting upon your life will not allow the reality of eternal life to find expression. So it is not a journey to become a dummy. It is a journey to exalt the word of God and bring it to a position in your life. Are we together now? Where when you look at the life of that individual, you see the excellency of the word, regardless your profession, regardless whatever it is that you're doing. Now the challenge with many believers is that when they got born again, they did not know that before they received eternal life, there was already a bank of error. Error that came through demonic activities. Watch this now. Error that came as a result of maybe negative sides of culture. Error that came as a result of suggestions. Error that came as a result of mistakes in our carrying out our priesthood. Probably you did not have the honor and the privilege of sitting under an accurate teaching priest. And there were many things you believed. You carried a backlog of information that was not true light. When you get born again, it is not God's responsibility to remove those things out. It is God's responsibility to give you the grace. It's called the enabling grace. And you through discipline, are we together? Discipline and vision, you partner with your destiny by carrying out this warfare. The real warfare is not casting out devils. The real warfare is these dethronements that need to happen. Now look up please. When an armed robber steals, I've taught you here, who is stealing? It's not the person. The person was born an innocent baby. Why did he become an armed robber? Because there were thoughts that were exalted. Are we together now? In that person's lifetime, he had heard that being kind is good. In that person's lifetime, he had heard that if you steal, you will go to prison. Why is he still stealing? He's not unaware of the fact that he's going to go to jail. He's not unaware of the fact that if you kill somebody and they catch you, you can stay there for life. Why does he still go to, to steal? Because there is another information that tells him that if you follow the way of dignity, you cannot grow. And so the easiest way is to steal, kill, and destroy. Stop a luxurious boss, and you can become a millionaire overnight. And that information has exalted itself against every advice his parents gave him. And that's what governs his life. So just because you are coming to church, it is not the sermon you are hearing that will change your life. It is what dominates your mind.
There are many ungodly songs that don't make sense. You never learn them by rehearsing them. You learn them by allowing their influence through repetition. And one day when they started singing, you were joining too. You didn't know when you were joining. You said, ah, God forgive me. But you still join. It started in the Babin Saloon. Huh? Then it went somewhere while you were waiting for your car to be full. Several things. Listen, if you don't understand why the Bible says, let this mind be in you. He was not speaking to unbelievers. Which was in Christ Jesus. There was a mindset. Do you know why Jesus protected his mind from age 12? Because he did not have control when he became the flesh, in the flesh, over everything that happened in his upbringing. But the moment he grew up, I hope you know at the point where Jesus came, the Jews were slaves under the captivity of Rome. There was a mindset Joseph had and Mary had. They could not train a savior with that mindset. As much as they were good parents, they could not raise a savior with that mindset. And so Jesus respected them, but he went to the temple and he sat down with the scribes. Even though the scribes and the Pharisees were not, but they were the closest people to having access to scripture. He needed to find out from scripture what was said about him and he still made do with them from age 12. And when they came and met him and said, you have been looking for you, he said, do you not know I should be about my father's business? What was he doing? For 18 years, it is written. For 18 years, finding where it was written, no, I come in the volume of the book. You think the Holy Ghost just gave him? No. Jesus, the word, as the logos of God, took the discipline of asking questions. Scribes and Pharisees, tell us what they said would happen when the Messiah comes. And while they were saying it, he was finding out about himself. Listen carefully. Let me teach you something, ladies and gentlemen. I hope God is speaking to you. <laughs> Some of you are looking with shock. Um, what you are hearing is the truth. Now listen. You see, when you contend for transformation by the word of God, do you know how transformation leads to victory? It leads to victory by doing two things. Number one, transformation leads to victory by empowering you to make superior destiny advancing choices and decisions. The first way transformation leads to victory is by empowering the transformed to make superior destiny advancing choices and decisions. So the first area where you see the value of transformation is in the quality of your choices and your decisions. I'll take that again. That transformation translates to victory by empowering the transformed to make superior destiny advancing choices and decisions. Ah, this is powerful. Write this and look up. Let me teach you something. Imagine Put two believers like this. Just use your mind. I don't want to call people up because of time. Imagine brother A standing by my left. Imagine brother B standing by my right. You have that in your mind? Imagine that brother A is a Christian but does not know anything about prayer. Does not know anything about relationships. Does not know anything about the value of productivity. Look at me, please. Does not know anything about the law of honor does not know anything about the power of prophecy. Look how disadvantaged this our brother is. Is he a Christian? Yes. How many destiny helpers can he attract to his life with this kind of mindset? He does not know the value of honor. So when God sends a good man, he will insult them and recycle pain in his life and say, why is my life like this? His life is a reflection of an omission, something he does not know. When they say, lift your hands and receive, you say, what is there? Do words really matter? And this guy remains. The door that should be open for him cannot be open. Because when prophetic help comes, he does not have an understanding that has shown him the value of this. Let me tell you the truth. Failure does not just happen. Failure looks for a mindset to partner with for failure to manifest. 
It's just that the mindset is subconsciously built. So the victim who is failing does not know that he labored to create a mindset for spirit to produce failure. Are we together? Quality choices and quality decisions. You know the level of transformation that is working in your mind by the kinds of choices that you make. I'm feeling tired and sleepy for no reason. Should I really come to church? No. That is a mindset that has advised you to behave that way. Am I right on that? You wind your hand and you slap your wife. I've taught you it's not your hand that slapped the wife. It's a mindset that said by slapping your wife, she will respect you. And you obeyed the mindset and acted it. Are we together now? When a child becomes stubborn, returns home one o'clock, and they say, where are you coming from? He say, I'm not a child. Oh. Huh? I'm a big boy. That definition of big boy did not come from the dictionary. That definition of big boy came from something social media or society gave him. Am I right on that? And he decided to adopt that definition. Do you think there, there's no small Bible study in that child's brain? There's still Bible study in that child's brain. His John 3.16 of, of Sunday school is still there. It's just that there's no sufficient truth to gain dominance over everything that fights him. Most people do not know that transformation is warfare. A warfare to dethrone thoughts, reasonings, mindsets, information that fights your destiny, that fights your greatness. I'm about to say something very powerful that I want you to listen to. We convert transformation to victory by its empowerment or, or uh, transformation leads to victory and liberty by empowering the saints to make superior destiny advancing choices and decisions. Now listen please. How does transformation by light lead to liberty? This right here that I'm about to teach you is the most important information that brought us here tonight. And I pray for you in the name of Jesus. May your eyes be open. Amen. Say amen. amen. Help us, Holy Spirit. Now listen. <clears throat> Thoughts, mindsets, and belief systems have an energy that they emit. Listen, please. Thoughts, mindsets, and belief systems, they exhibit magnetic properties. Hear this again. Thoughts, mindsets, belief systems, reasonings, they have an energy. Every single one of them has an energy that they emit from within you to your environment. They exhibit magnetic properties. They attract to your life. Listen, people, they attract to your life conditions. They attract to your life circumstances consistent with that belief. This is very powerful. I want to show you how transformation leads to victory and how lack of it keeps you in defeat. That thoughts, mindsets, information generally, they have power. There is an energy that comes from them. Are we together now? And that they exhibit magnetic properties. That when trouble comes to you and keeps coming to you, you may not believe it, but there is something within you magnetizing trouble. Job said, let me show you a scripture. Job chapter 3 and verse 25. The thing that I greatly feared, that was not the only thing he feared, but the one he greatly feared was the one that came. Did you get that? Job had other fears, but the one that was the most dominant fear, read it with me, one to go. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. This is the mystery of deep calling unto deep. That when, and even till today, terrorists use this strategy to attack people. They will send fear and say, we are coming. 
we are coming. And by the time the people absorb the fear, they become incapacitated before the attack. They will never come until they inflict fear. That was what Goliath was doing. Goliath knew that he would not win an army until he did something to their minds. History is full of people, dictators, who have lived and died. They knew this as a formula for victory, that if I can penetrate your mind and plant a picture and enthrone that picture to be higher than anything, even without an attack, you will die. When David came, Goliath, do you notice that the first way Goliath started attacking David was through words. As soon as he came, because he would speak to the armies and say, no, these guys are already defeated. The king was afraid. Here was a teenager who stood. And when they began to speak, Goliath said, no, this guy does not sound like the army. Am I a dog that you are coming with me with this? And he said, that, that's not the issue. Goliath, you come to me with your bows and your spears, but I come to you in a name. While you did not see me, I was not just in the wilderness. There was a mindset. He told Saul, he said, listen. Saul said, How are you, what, what credentials do you have to allow you to go and fight Goliath? He said, sir, with all due respect, one day I was in the wilderness and a lion came. I chased that lion with my bare hands. I chased the bear with my bare hands. I tore it. There was no social media to post it. But it did not mean the mentality of victory was not in me. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It was not his mouth that was speaking. His most dominant thoughts. You know the dominant thought? The knowledge of God. He says, I come to you in a name. The revelation of the name and the victory that it holds was greater than the sight of swords and spears. And he said, Goliath, by that name, because David knew, he said, by you I will run through a troop, and by my God I will leap over a wall. He knew that a body without a spirit is dead, that Goliath was empowered by demon evil spirits. That Goliath was not just a beast. Goliath stood representing wizardry. And that there was a force if you dislodge, no matter how large the body is, it will come down. He had a mentality. Jesus did not just defeat Satan because of, no, he knew. You know why Jesus was silent? Because he was talking anyhow that transferred dominion. When he met Adam, Adam blamed the Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Serpent did not blame anybody. And so dominion went to him. So when Jesus came, he was silent, even when he had something to say. Listen. Please listen to me. Poverty has a mindset if it does not find, it cannot manifest. Wealth has a mindset. If it does not find, it cannot manifest. Causes have a mindset. If they don't find, they cannot manifest. Blessings have a mindset. If they don't find, they cannot manifest. God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12. Abraham did not have the mindset to make that happen. God had to prime him by using the stars and say, count it, he kept failing. He said, so shall thy seed be. Finally, Abraham believed God. That reality became greater than barrenness. And the Bible says it was credited like a transfer. So that transfer could not happen. You know how you make transfer from your account. And he says he cannot. It was credited to him. As righteousness the anointing has a mindset for it to flow you cannot be a defeated person and you want to liberate others by what thinking no matter how much gallon of oil is poured on you your mindset would deflate the potential was it not the size of the vessel that controlled the oil the oil was never small it was put in a small jar so it looks small what was the prophet's recommendation? Expand the jar. Expand the jar. Thoughts, belief systems have an energy. Have an energy. Have an energy. 
Let me tell you this. Now, I'm not encouraging you to practice this, but I just want to encourage you. Do you know there are a group of people from the secular called hustlers? You know who a hustler is by the world's definition? Somebody that does not rest. When one door closes, he doesn't have time to cry. He will force another one. Most of those people eventually succeed from the world's way. You know why? Because they have seen victory and there is no pain in between that stops them. The person loses a job by the next day, he's roaming around Abuja. There's no time for sympathy except demons attack them. If not, they will win. This was the mentality that Nimrod had in Genesis 11. No Holy Spirit, no demon, but men who had already built in their mind. Give us Genesis 11, 4 and 5. I show you how great companies have been built in our world. I show you how God by his majesty built this ministry. I show you how your life will be built. It will not be built by luck. Victory will not manifest by wishes and sentiments. Nimrod said, let us build. They've not started. Let us build a city and a tower. Look at his description. Whose top may reach the heavens. Now, there are various kinds and various levels of heavens. So he's not just talking of heaven where God dwells. Are we together? I don't have time to tell you that there is a portion of heaven that no man has been there. Nobody. Nobody. No mortal man who was once on earth is there now. No. There is a portion. Heaven is not just a large room that you can enter anyhow just with the throne room. No. No. There are many heavens. There's atmospheric heaven. There is the realm of the spirit. There are other galaxies and planets. I hope you know God created them. And there are things there beyond science. Let me just leave that one there. Let's not go into those discussions. But just know it for a fact that we are not alone. There are regions beyond the sight of men. There are regions beyond the sight of science. This earth we see is suspended with a foundation that is invisible. Geography says it's floating. The book of Job said it had cornerstones. It was built with a foundation. There is a part of earth that is visible. That's the part we see. But there is a part that is mysteriously invisible. This is what makes God God. We can stretch our knowledge. The Bible said there is no searching of his understanding. So there are certain portions where people have gone to. It's the reason why when you base your Christian experience on just visions and extra biblical encounters, you may be sincere, but you will mislead a lot of people. Three of us can go to heaven and go to different regions of heaven. We return with our encounters and we may document things that may end up misleading the saints. It is the reason why the believer's point of focus must be scripture. I've had many encounters, but none of those encounters become a basis for doctrine. Are we together now? I say this because particularly if you are called into the prophetic ministry, you have to be careful. The strength of your encounters, just because the angel that appeared, how many of them do you know? An angel can appear to you genuinely. Once you are not on earth, you call the name of where you are heaven. You may be wrong. There are many, many regions. Many regions. Are we together? Many regions. The Bible says so. I don't want to go into all of those. But there are many regions. Even when you are out of the earth, there are dimensions in the spirit. There are many things here now, but the dimension we are in now cannot allow us to see them like angels you have to be open to that dimension to see but they see what you are seeing are we together there are dimensions where you don't need gravity there are dimensions where you don't need memory there are dimensions where you don't need to speak to communicate it is another agency that is for communication so it's important we manage encounters with wisdom i'm just digressing in a minute to say that so that the strength of your experience does not just become your supernatural encounters. I've done a teaching on that, you can get me. If not, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. If I run this ministry based on the encounters that I've seen, there will be many practices that may seem to work for a while, but it will deviate people from God. So regardless your encounters, you'll bring them to line up with scripture. And some of them are personal encounters. There are things God has told me that applies to only me and my work with him. If I create a doctrine out of it, it will destroy people. They will not be able to become.
we together? Jesus made a statement in John 14, 13. Let's read. I want to show you something now. John 14, verse 13. Please, I'd like you to shout it as loud as you can. <laughs> Ready? One to read. Uh-huh. Read the B part again. For the prince, one to go. What exactly is Jesus saying? For the prince of this world cometh and had nothing in you. So the prince of this world is attracted by something that looks like him in me. And the reason why he came to Jesus, but, but that mission was fruitless, was because there was no parallel of anything evil that Satan could relate with. Are we together now? When victory comes, it comes to look for victory that is inside you by the word. And if there is no victory within you by scripture, it cannot manifest. When causes come, when they come and they find out that you have been fortified through knowledge, is the reason why we don't just minister deliverance, we teach people how to come into victory. Because if all there is is casting out the demons, and you leave the people like that, you will keep casting out demons forever. But when you cast out the demons, then the second level is deliverance through transformation. You are helping them now understand so that when Satan will come, your enlightenment does not stop him from coming. There is no spiritual exercise greater than Jesus' prayer and fasting for 40 days. He being the word, but the first person he saw, after that elaborate exercise is Satan. The defeat is not in Satan's coming. The defeat is that something within you gives him an edge over you. A thinking. There is an energy. Are we together now? Yes. Listen to something I wrote here. I said victory depends on a belief system. Defeat depends on a belief system. Being victimized by curses and yokes is mentally dependent, not just spiritually dependent, not just demonic. Increase and prosperity depends on a belief system. Manifesting excellence and leadership depends on a belief system. Walking in the anointing Depends on a belief system. You can be saved and still be a victim of limitations and frustrations. You can be saved. Yes, sir. You can be genuinely saved and still be a victim of limitations and frustrations that plagued you before you got saved. That means those things were there. And even after you got saved, they did not recognize it. The oppression still remained. And yet you are genuinely born again. It's why many believers doubt their salvation. Once you believe in the name of the Lord genuinely with your heart, you are saved. But because you do not understand the journey beyond salvation. You see that now? That there is a journey beyond salvation. In addition to your being saved. The journey, the way now, then the truth, then life. You will find out that at a point you say, look, I'm just going, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm a child of God. I don't, my, this, my salvation is not authentic. It is. But it is that the knowledge of God has not been exalted in your mind above every other knowledge. Are we together? Do you know why you come to church every week? It is that project called transformation. What you are receiving now there is an ascendance. There is a warfare happening in your mind. That's the reason why sometimes you hear some things and you're like, ah, this thing is hard. Should I believe? Should I not believe? Other mindsets that are there, when you see people respect them and honor them, carry a gift and go and give your boss and your superior, whether you like them or not, and say thank you for the privilege of working here. Your pride and your ego, which has been a mindset that kept you, will fight that belief. 
is all not profitable. Why should I do that to somebody younger than me? Uh -huh. That belief system, but by the time you keep hearing and hearing, you see what is happening? One day, the Spirit of God who is aiding that transformation process brings you to a point where that exaltation happens. Let me tell you, there is an energy, there is a force that begins to emanate from you. That force is what draws bad friends to people or draws good friends. That force is what draws gifted people to ministries. There are ministries that will never lack gifted people. It is a grace, but the grace comes through a mindset. There is an above only mindset. Are we together now? The Bible is a compendium of mindsets, giving you a chance to choose the one you will use with the wisdom of an architect to design your life. You shall be exalted above all the nations of the earth. These blessings will come upon you. It's a mindset. When men say there is a casting down, they are not verses, they are mindsets. You can buy them with humility and place them and begin to ward the limiting mindsets. Oh, I think I, I, I don't believe God blesses people. Uh, prosperity is unnecessary. It's a mindset. Why is it unnecessary? It's a mindset. It leads people away from God. You see that? It's a mindset. But the owner, the holiest person of all, owns the earth and owns everything. And yet, he did not backslide by owning the earth. The cattle on a thousand hill belongs to him. And yet, his holiness did not diminish with the presence of these things. So where did you get the mindset that increase and abundance just diminishes you? No, it reflects something that is already within you. You don't need to have money to not be serious with God. Are you seeing that now? It's a mindset. Oh, increase does not matter. It doesn't matter whether crowds of people come. It does not. It's a mindset. When you know that salvation is for all men, salvation is a business of numbers. Numbers matter when you're talking about salvation. But that does not mean if there are not many people, you are not doing well. But salvation is a business of numbers. So you would see men like our father in the Lord, Daddy Gio. He would say, plant churches around. Let there be soul winning. And in his, at his age, he's still going around holding light-up campaigns. I've had the honor of preaching in one, I think at least one of them. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm a young man. But what is such an old man doing? It's a mindset. One day, I remember telling um, one of his people and said, please, tell daddy to rest. And he said, don't waste your time. He will not rest. He said, we'll rest when we go here, when we go out of this world. It's a mindset. Another lazy young man has an arrival mentality with one million naira. It's a mindset. Another arrogant preacher with nothing is a mindset. Joshua Selman, arrogant at this level, but there's somebody who never arrives. Arrival is a mindset. The passion to continue is a mindset. And all of this mindset exact energy. Let me tell you, you are being affected by my mindset. If I plant two, you will be surprised that the little you have done, you will become comfortable. When you see champions continue, it swallows up what you are doing and you go back and say, my God, if this person can do like this. It's a mindset. When you see anointed people still praying and fasting and studying the word, it's a mindset that there are still more lands to conquer. Are we together now? Yes. Please, believers, hear me. If this sermon does not affect you, then forget about liberty. Demons used to oppress me as a preacher. I've told you my story. Not as a believer, as a preacher, I was already anointed. I would go for programs and great miracles would happen and return back and lie down. And here comes these spirits to my room. I said, what is all this nonsense? How can I be ministering in the power of God and then I return back and they're oppressing me? Because they have no respect for whether you are called pastor, whether you are called prophet. Once they find something that attracts them, they will come. And they will not just come, they will prevail. Satan cometh to me. Poverty cometh to me. Prosperity cometh to me. So all the realities that you need and hate in life, you are like in a, permit me to use the word, a, a swimming pool that is full of everything. Poverty is flowing around you. 
Wealth is flowing around you. Increase is flowing around you. But the one that comes to you is the one that finds a component within you that draws it to you. This is the concept of what we know to be familiar spirits. You know why they are familiar? They want certain occurrences to remain in certain lives, in certain territories. So they study the mindset that attracts that trouble and they create a stronghold around it so that everybody from that family thinks that way. Grandfather transfers it to father. So the evil continues. If a child stands up and says, I'm breaking it, you don't break it by saying, I rebuke it alone. You rebuke it, but you start re-engineering your thinking. Another kind of energy is now sent to your village, not me not me and the curses will come but they will not meet someone of that kind of bloodline again because something has been altered are we together here i wrote something here pastors and ministers with all due respect must realize the sensitivity of the roles that they play in literally determining the destinies of people and by extension the destiny of a nation i think it was last year or so i was in the u.s and one of the things i was studying was what made the u.s the u.s at least in its state of glory that we know i didn't just want to celebrate because i believe that i have a contribution to helping nigeria helping Africa to become a reflection of the glory of God. And it will not just happen by preaching verses. There was a mindset. Last I traveled to the U.S., I had the opportunity to travel and pray where America started. And I had the opportunity to visit the monument of the forefathers. And I saw a few things that were written there. The tenants that were the foundations of America, I said, this is it. This is it. No nation. Please listen to my message, how nations are built. It was an Independence Day message. How nations are built. There are policies. Policies are products of mindsets translated into law. Are we together? If you believe in equality, you believe in excellence, it's a mindset. You will simply articulate it and write it. It becomes part of your constitution. So if Africa is the way we are, the, the problem is not just the troubles that we have around. We have to go back and re-examine the frame, the foundation upon what? Listen, you must have the courage to probe your belief systems. How did we get here? Who believed what that made this kind of nonsense? Are we together? It's important. The difference between a great ministry and a limiting, struggling ministry is not just the will of God is the belief system of the leaders. What mindset? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, you did not just come here just by your will. I tell you, I hate to be the one to say this, but there is an energy that is exerted from transformation. And because it is God's principle, he will weigh you and he will bring men that reflect your growth and transformation. At this level of growth, it will be stupid for me to believe that God will trust me with the kind of daddy Geo's influence that God will trust me with the kind of reach of, say, the RCCG globally. One day we'll get there, but the truth is that we're not yet there. There is something they know. The very fact that we have not learned the secret of their humility is a sign that there's something we don't know. Because there are certain heights when you get to, you will now be transformed to see the value of humility. Are we together? My question now is, what is in you, help those under the anointing, what is in you that has been exalted above the knowledge of God that gives Satan access? When I found this key, my life changed. Look at me. I can give you 10 million naira now if the level of financial transformation you have in your mind is 1 million. An energy will come through your mindset and take away 9 million mysteriously until 1 million is left. Because it will interpret 10 million as an error. Your physical life is inconsistent with your growth. It will alter it. I want you to believe what business be there. We have intelligent people here. There are leaders here. You know. It's true. 
it is the reason why people get angry and say, I have been 10 years in this company. They are not promoting me. There is something your superior knows. It is true that in terms of time, oh, you have been there, but they have weighed you. They found out that this position of a director, if they put you there, your mindset, your longevity of stay is valid. You are due for promotion, but it's not an attack. If they give you a responsibility bigger than your mind because you have not yet valued integrity as a core value, and it is dangerous to now put you in charge of finances. Are we together? As a husband, you ate your wife's money. You ate your son's money that said, see, break two. You ate it as a father. And yet you want to be director over finances. No, I don't care what kind of impartation you receive. Something within you will tell limitation. This is the right state of this man. And the realm of the spirit will respect it. Are we together? My life changed when I realized this. I stopped wasting my time pursuing things. With all due respect, as we prepare to wrap up, this is the tragedy of our social media generation. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, except that it has become a healthy tool to sell falsehood. Did you hear what I said? A healthy tool to sell falsehood. That means I can propose a level to men that I've not gotten to by growth and even force them to believe it. Now, the problem is the moment they believe it, I am under pressure to defend it with the results. And the results will keep running away from me because I, I only sold a lie. I had not gotten there by growth. So you stand in front of an aircraft and you take this thing you do and put it there and people say, hallelujah, glory to Jesus. They expect it to happen again because they assume you have grown to that level. So somebody who knows you can send you a text and say, please, I used to know you before in primary school. Can you help us with one million naira? And he said, let me tell you the truth. Even 2,000, I don't have. What was, listen, what was that stage doing there? You see the trouble you have created to yourself? There are many battles that are unnecessary. They don't have rewards. Falsehood created them. What you see today in this ministry is a product of yesterday's mindset. By the privilege of God's grace, tomorrow will show the adjustment we have made in our thinking. Are we together? It is impossible. Listen, I think I used to tell the school of ministry students, let's assume, I like to use the fathers for an example. Ladies and gentlemen, let's assume that Daddy Gio just walks in here and says, brethren, I forgot my wallet and my car keys. What do you think is going to happen to him? The mindset he has through the sacrifice of grace does not allow the holder of that mindset to be without help. Are you getting the point now? So the moment he makes that announcement, you who did not give to your relative will carry 10 million and say, sir, I've been praying to give you. And he says, I don't need it. He said, no problem. Another person will go and buy a brand new car in Abuja with all this economic problem you are saying. There is a mindset that forbids him to be struggling. Did you get that now? It's the truth. It's the truth. I saw this with my life, with all due respect. I never told people, stop giving me five naira. Stop giving me two naira. All I needed to do was to grow to a point that giving me one naira becomes unfair. You don't have to tell people. Don't tell people to change their Change your own value and grow. It will reflect in the way people perceive you. I tell you why some people will never come to your restaurant. There is something in that restaurant that fights their vision. They want to go forward. They want to be inspired. But because there are flies in your restaurant, and the moment they are done eating, you want to maximize profit, you have only two workers in a restaurant as big as this place. And people come there, the tables are unkept, they are not clean, everything is careless, and then you are charging them. Something in that restaurant is driving their level of transformation. So there is a certain class of people, as a man of God, with all due respect, I will tell you, there is a certain class of people that will never come to identify with your vision. You know why? When they see childishness, immaturity, you are wasting their time, no intelligence, the truths are not life applicable, there is no discipline. 
Nobody who carries wife and children as a director, as a great person. Influence has a mindset. Influence is a language. That when you pay the price to rise to that level, you will command the attention of those who find it in you. This is how transformation leads to liberty. If I want koinonia to grow higher than this, it starts by spiritual growth, then intellectual growth, then greater growth. I have to dominate my mind with a mindset that attracts the level I'm looking for. Are we together now? If my thinking stops, koinonia stops to reflect my mindset. If I backslide in my thinking, mysteriously, you will not have the passion to come here again. It will not be that you hate me. Something about your appetite for growth is being fought by my lack of growth. Let me tell you the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to become an exceptional leader, grow to a point where your transformation is so superior, it becomes unfair to be ignored. Unfair to be ignored. Doesn't matter what nation you go to, unfair to be ignored. Hallelujah. I was jokingly telling my school of ministry students that when I went to deliver my lecture in Harvard, something happened to my notes. The morning that I was going to deliver the lecture, my softwares were updating, and this thing just scattered my notes like that. I had like three or so hours, and then a major part of my lecture notes had just disappeared. I said, what is this? But you see, if you know those days will come, start preparing now. How do you prepare? By relating with global minds, relating with global informations. This is your commitment to God and your destiny that I don't want to remain small. All that notes that I put in the lecture was prepared within three hours. You see, there are things you cannot fake. You can copy a note and read it, and intelligent people will look at you and say, this is the last time you will come here. Because they know you are disconnected with that result. It did not come from you. I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever you have allowed to keep you in one place. Whatever has come into partnership with Satan in your life. Through your mind. In the name of Jesus, let it depart now and forever. Yeah. Sit down. Let me wrap up. Greed is a mindset. It's not an attitude. Is a mindset, a mindset that has informed you that all you have is all there is. And if you bring out anything and give, whether to God or his servants or anything, it depletes you. You interpret depletion as losses, and so you don't give. Giving is a mindset. The Macedonians had it. What is the mindset? The mindset is built from scripture that there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. The first time you read that scripture, it will wrestle the general idea to keep. You have to keep planting that seed by hearing and repetition until it gains ascendance beyond every other information. How about laziness? Laziness is beyond an attitude. It is a mindset. A mindset. Diligence is a mindset. I told you that every time you open the Bible, see heaven proposing different mindsets for you. This is the kind of life I've prepared for you. I set before you blessing and cursing. A life of excellence or a life of mediocrity. Choose. So every time you wake up in the night and you are studying scripture, do you know what you are saying? Lord, I agree with the mindset of a victor. Or Lord, I agree with the mindset that kept those behind me or those who came before me limited. A man of God asked me a question and said, how do you prepare your sermons? Because sometimes we see you everywhere from pillar to post and yet on Sunday. I said, what of those who preach multiple times every week? There is a system for excellence and efficiency. If you don't know it, follow them. Go through faith and patience. Instead of disgracing your destiny again, there's no need reinventing the wheel. There are people who have mastered the art of efficiency. Are we learning now? Some of you are here and you desire promotion. Let me tell you sincerely. I will speak over you, but I've taught you the value of the anointing is when it rests upon a transformed mind. The mind gives the capacity 
prophecy and the speakings of God now gives allowance for it to find expression. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, excellence is a mindset. Insisting on standards is a mindset. Cutting corner is a mindset. I hope you know that. Bribery and corruption is a mindset. It's not an attitude, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. When God wants to help you, he opens up the way through salvation. And he now begins to do the work of a mindset. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, transformation is warfare. Transformation is warfare. Because there are contents already in your mind, releasing all kinds of energies and attracting to your life unpleasant situations. Listen, the things that God has brought to my life today were always there, but there was a version of me they were looking for. And the former version of me made it unfair for them to come. I hope you know when God called me, you were there. You were still on earth. Why didn't you come? Because my level of transformation made it unfair for someone of your destiny to be under me at that point. It took transformation alongside the mercy of God. Now he has brought you. There are still others. If I remain here, they will not come. A day will come where Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness. So if the light stops shining, only Gentiles will be there. But kings will not come. And so when we commit ourselves to excellence, when you keep praying as if you've not started, when you keep pressing as if you've not started, when you keep learning the laws again, let me tell you the truth. There is none of my messages that I don't listen to. It's a discipline. This message I'm preaching now, as I go back home between now and 3 a.m., I must listen to this message before I sleep. It's a discipline. If for any reason I skip it, there are disciplinary actions I met upon myself. You see that? Yes. If for any reason I sleep because I'm human and by morning I don't listen to this, I must listen to it at least two or three times. First for my personal edification and then two for improvement and correction. No week should be a worse version of me. Everything should be improvement. That is my commitment to keeping you. That is my partnership with God. When you want the nations to listen to you, you prepare like the person who is ready to speak to nations. You cannot prepare like one to speak to mediocres and want nations and kings to hear you, no matter what you have to say. Hallelujah. Some of you, the way you dress is the reason why kings cannot hear you. You dress like somebody who wants to steal from kings and they run away from you. Yes, sir. You don't dress like a king yourself. You remind them of the people that cause them pain and they run away from you. If you're a businessman here, let me challenge you. Go and have a meeting with your workers this week. Gather all of them and say, I came to church and an orientation was given by the man of God. Let's still have 30 minutes and have a meeting. You dress well. You clean this office. Go and get somebody. Say, Remove this paint that looks like this is a dilapidated structure. Paint, but it will take from my profit. It's a mindset. Every time you feel limited, just remember my message. It's a mindset. Go and scrape that paint. Put something nice. Put a signboard so that people will know this is where you are. Train your staff. When people come, you greet them. Good afternoon, sir. Is this so and so place? Yes, sir. Can I see your boss? Don't say, I, am I not a human being? No, it's a mindset. I'm wrapping up, but the church is a place of learning. Okay, I appreciate you, sir. Could you give me a minute? Let me just talk with him. If I have the permission, I'll let you know. But in advance, just for you to know that please, if he's busy, don't find offense. You have represented that company well. By the time the person calls, he will not be angry. He'll say, there's one of your staff. Her name is XYZ. This lady did something to me that made me, you are a good man. And because of that, what I was coming to tell you, the business contract will work. One person brought increase. Do you think they will not promote that one person? There is a science to promotion. It's not just superstition. If I'm a CEO, there are people I will never promote. And I will make sure they know it. 
if they are not going to grow. There's no sentiments anywhere. So a man of God, go and settle down, do your homework in the name of Jesus. Settle down and do your homework. If it's time to pray, pray. Don't stand before God's people and you keep speaking and say, be healed, be blessed. No testimonies, nobody's coming. No grace, no fire. Let me tell you, members love you, but they love their destinies too. They love their children too. If they see indefinitely that there are no fruits of transformation, there's no fruit of genuine encounter, they will love you, but they will quietly go and look for where they will find answers. Am I right on that? We're going to pray. Let me give you two final thoughts. Write this down. Knowing the truth by the ministry of light makes you see and reveal the value of salvation. Knowing the truth by the ministry of light will make you see in your life and will make you reveal the true value of salvation. That means the real value of salvation is displayed at the point of your transformation. If you are not transformed, you will cheapen salvation and make it look like Jesus did not really do anything spectacular. The excellency, the real value in salvation is revealed not just at the point of the new birth, but at the point of transformation. That is when you will see his power. That is when you will see his wisdom. That is when you will see his favor. That is when you will see the influence. That is when you will see the excellence. Final word for tonight. The ultimate proof, and please let me request you write this. The ultimate proof of the presence and the power of light is not intelligence, but liberty. The ultimate proof of the presence of and power of light is not intelligence but liberty that means when all is said and done the proof that you have enjoyed the ministry of light is not just that you become more brilliant or more enlightened is the liberty that your life commands and the liberty that you bring to others on account of your life because in his light we see light in your light as his representative others too should see light are we together? No matter what I say I know about healing, no matter what I say I know about transformation, no matter what I say I know about favor, the end product of it is the liberty that attests to that knowledge. If it cannot happen, something is wanting with your life. It is false light you are carrying. It is the reason why we continue to press. Thank God for what we've seen, but for the sake of other areas we have not seen, we keep pressing unashamedly pressing forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth for the things that are before he says I press so the ultimate proof of the presence and the power of light I repeat for one last time is not intelligence there are many intelligent people but they cannot command liberty in their lives and they cannot command liberty in the lives of others I've taught tonight on the ministry of light this is the journey beyond salvation. It is how people use light as a tool and as a weapon to dethrone imaginations, to dethrone thoughts, to dethrone reasonings, to dethrone mindsets until that which is consistent with the word of God becomes so exalted and elevated, literally becomes the frame of their thinking, superior information coming by the word superior information coming by the ministry of the Holy Spirit superior information coming by the blessings of priesthood are we together and on account of that that you submit yourself bringing yourself closer to light hearing like you are hearing and receiving in your spirit and then allowing yourself through consistency and repetition to be transformed by that light obtaining grace to make decisions that are consistent with your transformation and allowing that glorious light, that energy, that indescribable force that leaves the transformed. The force that leaves you is like a messenger. 
it goes around Abuja, it goes around Lagos, it goes around Africa, saying favor, come to this sister. Blessings, come to this sister. It is on account of that you can say, like it was said to Abraham, you are blessed in the city and you are blessed in the country. You are not blessed because of location. You are carrying the same mindset. So the effect becomes the same in Europe, the same in Africa, the same everywhere. If Africa does not contend for transformation, even if we relocate everywhere, it's like a new car with the same driver. You will reproduce the same result. Are you ready to pray? Please rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. We are going to pray just two prayers and we're done. Prayer point number one. Father, I receive your light. Go ahead and pray. I receive your light. High level spiritual illumination. The light that will transform superior thoughts, superior ideas, superior beliefs. Someone pray. One minute. Sabalika parakatoskiata. Embra katabeleke parus kevrende beresko balesh. Egra pakata parondos kobrende beleke pariata. Jabra kaparade kebereko tosiata. Light in the name of Jesus. Light in the area of my finances. Light in the area of my spiritual life. Light in the area of my career. Light in the area of family and relationships. Light in the area of leaderships and my pursuit. I receive light by the Spirit. Light beyond the influence of culture. Light beyond the influence of my background. Light beyond the influence of my limitations. Someone pray. You may be born in Nazareth, but you don't need to carry the mindset of the Nazarenes. You can carry the mindset of he that has come from above because he that comes from above is above all. You are a Nigerian, a proud one at that, but carry the mindset of a global giant. Carry the mindset of one who has come from above, through Nigeria, above, through Nigeria, above, through Nigeria, above, through Africa. You are an agent of change, an agent restoring righteousness, an agent restoring order within your system. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, final prayer, pray this with all your heart, the discipline to partner with God as he seeks to transform me, that will be your next prayer and final prayer tonight, the discipline, it is not a gift, transformation is not a gift, there is no gift of transformation in the Bible, there is a labor dimension to transformation. What God does is to give you the enabling grace. Go ahead and pray, everybody. Transformation. The discipline. Pray. The discipline to learn the principles of wealth, not just to assume it. The discipline to learn how ministry works. The discipline. To learn how leaders become people of influence. The discipline to learn how spiritual growth happens. The discipline to learn how the anointing comes. How it increases. Hallelujah. Let me speak over your life. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Like a candle, light me up, 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 like a candle, light me up, light me up, light me up, one more time, light me up, light me up, light me up, light me up.
person. There is a mentality that when you have by grace, you will never be poor. It doesn't matter what happens. It's not pride. The energy that leaves from you will edit everything that will bring you poverty. And if anything happens in your life that looks like poverty, is God's law. It will send a signal to the spirit. This kind of mindset should not be in lack. Men and systems will realign themselves until you bounce back. It's a law. Increase is a mindset. When you understand the mindset of increase, then the grace for increase comes. Listen, grace is come in honor to mindsets. Grace is come in honor to beliefs. Never forget this. Grace is come in honor to mindsets. Don't just look for graces. Find out the mindset that the graces are looking for. There is a kind of mindset that when you have, even before you pray for the grace, it would have arrived. Because the mindsets are magnets. It is true. There are things I began to experience in my life before intentionally praying for them. I focused on transformation. And the, the power, the force that was exerted, my God, you want to see magnetic power? Have a superior mindset and see what it will draw to you. It will draw a helper from the ends of the earth and bring it to your house. Everybody to help you is around. And everybody to destroy you is around. Your mindset selects them and permits them to come. Or selects them and keeps them far from you. The power of God does not just function arbitrarily. There are people who have a mindset of life. No matter what death does, it will not kill them. Their mindset will forbid them to die. You believe me when I tell you this. There are people who have gone through things you will never imagine. There was a mindset of life. If the mindset was not there, God would not say choose life. Choose life means you can choose wealth. Choose wealth means you can choose excellence. Choose excellence means you can choose growth. As for me, I have taken time by the Spirit of God to sit down and write a list of things that I want to see and a list of things that will go. So when I say sit and go away, I don't just pray a carnal childish prayer. As I drive him, I also remove the mindset that attracts him to me. When you say poverty, go. You have to receive the mindset that ejects poverty thinking. So that the next time it comes, like Jesus, you will say, Satan cometh to me. Limitations cometh to me. Challenges cometh to me. But there was nothing in me that could attach itself to them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have brought your counsel to your people. <laughs> that there is a journey beyond new birth. Is a journey with the ministry of light and that the light of God is able to build us to build our minds and position us for liberty and victory I pray for you every mindset that you need to have may you begin the journey of getting it by the Spirit and hear me if there is anything you have attracted to your life trouble failure tragedies causes knowingly or unknowingly you use your mindset to partner with evil for your destruction let mercy speak for you now 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 therefore i prophesy upon you rise to a new level don't reject it rise to a new level may your spiritual life scale to a new height let the power of the Holy Ghost rest upon you. I speak favor upon you. I call you victorious. I call you blessed. I call you favored. I call you honored by God. When men say there is a casting down, for you there will be a lifting up. I declare that kings will look for you. Nobles will look for you. Captains of industry will look for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Regardless your background, I empower you to excel. What your father could not do, go ahead and do it. What your mother could not do, go ahead and do it. 
the limitations that came with where you are coming from i cut it away from your life the discipline to be transformed receive the grace for it wave your hands to jesus in jesus name i pray use this week to settle on certain teachings go to koinonia global scan through the teachings and see the areas that are wanting in your results take on a project to transform yourself believe him now you know what happens when you are transformed and you watch what happens in your life in the name of jesus salvation is the first step to that journey of liberty now like i said everybody has the right to decide on jesus or otherwise every week god sends in people here scattered across the overflows scattered within the auditorium the starting point is not prophecy not healing not deliverance the starting point is an encounter with jesus and while you heard me speak the holy ghost began to nudge it in your spirit that this is the word for you i want to make an altar call now counting one to five you are in this place and you know from the depth of your heart that you need Jesus. You've not even started that journey. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Or you are here and you also want to rededicate your life genuinely to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to leave your seat as I count one to five. Run for sake of time. Come and stand here. I begin my counting now. One. Let's celebrate them as they come. Two. Koinonia, are you celebrating them? Run to Jesus, young and old, rich and poor, male, female, come, three. Doesn't matter how your life has been before now, he's able to give you a new beginning. Come, my sister, come, my brother. Don't be ashamed of anyone who is looking at you, no. This is the business of you and Jesus, come. Make sure you leave your seat and come if you should come. The moment the Holy Spirit speaks to you, hear that preacher and don't sit back. Come. Koinonia, thank you for clapping. That is how men will celebrate you. That is how they will celebrate your testimonies. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Hallelujah. Some of you are crying. Don't be ashamed of your tears. Look at me. The Bible says... As many who will come to him, listen, my brothers and sisters, it says he will in no wise cast away. Every time you are called to come to Jesus, imagine yourself being called to receive an award, except that this is an award that surpasses any you have received or any you will ever receive. The award is not a thing. It's not a present. It's a person, Jesus himself. And as I leave you to make this simple prayer, I want you to mean it from your heart. I salute your courage to have stood here before him. Lift your right hand if you will. Please say this after me as loud and as clear as you can. It includes those following online and all the overflows and all our expressions across the globe, all the viewing centers across everywhere. Say, Lord Jesus. Say it again, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I've heard your word. I need you. I need salvation. I love you with all my heart. Tonight, I ask Jesus to be my Savior, to be my Lord, and to be my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight and forever, I go from glory to glory and grace to grace. The life of God is at work within me. Amen. Keep your hands lifted. I break the power of sin. I break the power of Satan. I break the power of hell and the grave. I call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. The grace to live and walk in victory. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Like I taught and you heard, begin that journey to transformation. May you become signs and wonders at the end. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now very quickly. 
I want you to follow this gentleman, the counselors. They are waving a placard. They will have a word in one minute, and then you'll be back to your seat. Just guide those who are under the anointing so they don't hurt themselves. Hallelujah. Let me take one quick announcement. I wanted to take it before, but um, I didn't want to distract us. Please listen, everyone, before we wrap up. This is from the medical department, our medical department responsible for managing the health of the people within. The medical department is currently open to take in new members, healthcare professionals, especially doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and lab scientists. These are their points of interest. And anyone who belongs to this category and you desire to be part of our medical team, Please, after the service, whether you're outside, overflows, or in here, just move to the public relations desk. The PR desk is just outside of the main auditorium, and then you'll be given the forms to fill or a QR code to scan, and they'll guide you appropriately. Similarly, the aesthetics department, they manage the stage and everything that has to do with beautifying the house of God, is currently open to take in new members, I'm told here that they are looking for professional cleaners, florists, decorators, and event planners. So you belong to any of these categories, and you've been seeking for an opportunity to serve in the house of God. If you're skilled in any of this area, you can go out after the service also to our PR desk, and there would be a group of officials to guide you and give you what forms to fill. Um, I'm told that the closing date is on Sunday, April the 21st, April the 21st, before midnight, that door closes. So you want to serve in any of these departments, here's your chance to serve God and to serve him well. Have you been blessed tonight? Let me encourage you, number one, please take out time to listen to this teaching again. It's a discipline. Practice it. Number two, make sure that as much as possible you extend the teachings to as many people. This is beyond just trying to get a man. No, no, no. You know, we've, we've, by God's grace, God has shown us mercy. It's a campaign to bring transformation to as many who may never have the opportunity otherwise to hear these truths. So make sure that you extend it to your friends and your loved ones. Let them listen for their growth. Have you been blessed tonight? In the name that is above all names, your weak beginning is blessed. The hand of God is strong upon you. Go and return with favor. Go and return with testimonies. The lines have fallen for you in pleasant places. You have a goodly heritage in Jesus' name. Let's share the grace together in fellowship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercies follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord.